Welcome to church. We're glad you're here. So if you would rise with us, we're going to get started with the song. One, two, three, four. to welcome you this morning to St. Paul's. We're so grateful that you can be worshiping with us today, this morning, and whether you're visiting us in person or from afar on live stream, we're just very grateful to have you here this morning. At this time, would you please pull out your bulletin announcements and connection cards. 
This week, Pastor Ryan will be continuing our series in Walking in the Light based on 1 John. We look forward to his message and some more worship music ahead. But before we get to that, we have a few quick announcements. Actually, there's quite a few. They might not be that quick. <laughs> the, um, there is a discussion group based on the series The Chosen. And that is held here every other Thursday night. The next one is August 3rd from 7 to 9. Uh, every other Thursday, St. Paul's will be hosting this group to watch an episode of The Chosen and then discuss the episode afterwards. This week, we'll be watching Season 2, Episodes 6 and 7. There is also at the Willimantic Camp Meeting Association in Willimantic, there is a 2023 Bible conference called Bringing the Bible into Focus. This is August 9th through 13th. There's multiple sessions, and you are invited to join them for eight sessions of live music and Bible study at the Tabernacle, and more information can be found on the St. Paul's What's Happening page. I'd also like to mention that starting today at the Willimantic Camp Meeting Association is our annual assembly week. This is a week of praise and prayer and vacation Bible school and concerts and food and all kinds of things happening there. It starts today at 4 o'clock for a service at the Tabernacle followed by the Sky Family Concert. And then each and every evening next week at 6 o'clock there is... Um, um, a revival uh, ministry and music, and also VBS for the children. And it's not too late. It starts tomorrow morning, but you could still bring your kids tomorrow morning. We don't mind any latecomers there. Um, so anyway, hope you can join us for some of that. That's actually where I live, so it has a special place in my heart. And another special thing that happens here at St. Paul's every year is the annual baptism and picnic at Bicentennial Pond. This year it will be on Sunday, August 27th, right after the service at noon. We hope you can join us directly following the service at Bicentennial Pond in Mansfield for a baptism and picnic. St. Paul's will provide the main dishes, burger, hot dogs, etc., and we are hoping that you can provide a drink, a side, or a dessert, but you don't have to bring anything to attend. Feel free also to bring an outdoor game, and if you are interested in finding out more about the baptism, you can email ryan at stpaulswired.org. And if you're kind of new to the church and don't know a lot of people, this is a great way to get to know everybody. We're really friendly. So each week, um, we ask that you fill out a connection card to let us know you were here worshiping with us this morning. There's also a link for our live stream viewers that you can fill out as well. These cards are a great way for you to keep in touch with us. There's a place on the front to fill out anything you'd like to be contacted about. And on the back of these cards is a place for prayer requests and prayers. We have a prayer team that meets and prays over these cards each week, and we'd love to be praying for you and anything going on in your life. Later in the service, there will be an opportunity to put your card in the offering basket underneath the communion table, and there is also a basket on the back table that you can put your card in on your way out. At this time, we'd ask you to stand for our invocation prayer and remain standing as we continue to worship the Lord through the music of this wonderful band. This morning's prayer was written by Reinhold Neuber from 1892 to 1971. Lord, we pray this day, mindful of the sorry confusion of our world, look with mercy upon this generation of your children so steeped in misery of their own contriving, so far strayed from your ways and so blinded by passions. We pray, we pray for the victims of tyranny that they may resist oppression and courage. With courage, we pray for wicked and cruel men whose arrogance reveals to us that the sin of our own hearts is like when it has conceived and brought forth its final fruit. We pray for ourselves who live in peace and quietness that we may not regard our good fortune as proof of our virtue or rest content to have our ease at the price of other men's sorrow and tribulations. 
We pray for all who have vision of your will, despite the confusions and betrayals of human sin, that they may humbly and resolutely plan for and fashion the foundations of a just peace between men, even while they seek to preserve what is fair and just among us and the threat of malign powers. Amen. At this time, um, we ask that you just greet each other with the passing of the peace. You can say hello, handshake, a fist bump, um, a hug if you know somebody well, and um, just take that time to greet one another. And may the peace of the Lord, I can't see it, sorry. <laughs> may the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with each and every one of you.
You may be seated. Right. Good morning, church. Well, before we get into the message this morning, um, I have an important announcement to make, which I know that many of you have heard already, uh, but I think it's important to, uh, to say, uh, which is that Lisa Laurie passed away uh, at the hospital last Thursday after a long illness. And I know many of us have been praying for her, and this is not the outcome that we were hoping for. We can, uh, of course, we can take comfort in knowing that she is safe with Christ, uh, that she is enjoying the, um, the eternal life that far outweighs any earthly suffering, and then far that makes up for any earthly suffering, but it's, of course, very hard to lose her um, at such a young age, and, of course, it's very painful to know that we will not see her anymore, and especially for Ron and Josh, who have been through so much. Uh, even though, Many of you know over the last month that Ron also lost his older son in a car accident. So Ron and Josh very much need our prayers and our support right now, and I know that they are watching on live stream right now. Uh, they're not quite ready to, to be back, of course, but... Um, uh, they are watching. Um, Ron and Josh, we love you guys. Um, and um, we, uh, we, we're, our hearts are heavy for you. Um, but Ron wanted me to tell all of you, this was very important to him, how much he appreciates uh, the prayers, the cards, the words of encouragement, the meals. Uh, you guys have done so much, and he is deeply appreciative and he just says he can't thank you enough. Um, and I thank you as well. Thank you for being the church uh, to a family who really needs uh, support and love right now. Um, so some of you have asked about a service. And uh, it's, you know, Lisa just passed on Thursday. So a service has not been scheduled yet. Uh, of course, I will let us all know as soon as I know any news about that. Um, but in the meantime, uh, please continue to pray for them. Uh, consider ways that you might be able to, to support Ron and Josh right now. And um, I, I've asked Andrea to uh, offer a prayer for the Lorries. And I'd like to invite us all just to, to show our support and love for them right now, to just stand together uh, as Andrea leads us in prayer. Yeah, pick a mic. Our Lord Jesus Christ, you who brought, you who destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, we thank you that you included Lisa in the gospel. You drew her heart to you. She is yours. She stood the test, she passed the test, she came forth as gold, and now her ending is actually her beginning, and we thank you for that. Abba Father, you who are not unfamiliar with such pain as Ron and Josh and Lisa's mom and her daughters, all her extended family, for you watched your own son, you who are life, be assailed by the powers of death and succumb. You know the heaviness of that. It is beyond us to bear. And yet you are the one who comforts us. You are the one who are close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. And for Ron particularly, yeah. And yet you know, and you are an ever-present help. And I pray, Father, that you would Wrap him in your arms such that he really feels that. That you say to him again and again, as we've sung in a chorus recently, yes, but I'm there. 
I'm standing next to you in the fire. Yes, I am there in the waters, holding back the waters. Father, sustain him. And Holy Spirit, you through whom Jesus offered himself to his Father, and you who produce hope within us, I pray that you would cause Ron's hope and all of Lisa's family and Josh, I don't know how he's processing this, but you do. May their hope overflow by your presence and your power. We commit them all into your care and we stand with them as much as mortals can stand with mortals and know that you do so much more. Thank you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So, last week, we started a new sermon series on the epistle known as 1 John, and I've decided to call it Walking in the Light, based on the theme of uh, the first message last week. And uh, we're just going to be picking up right where we left off, so I encourage you, if you have your own Bible, you want to follow along to find 1 John, it's right near the end. Uh, it goes 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Jude, Revelation. Uh, and there are little books at the end there, so you just kind of go back to Revelation and then back up a little bit, and you'll find 1 John. And we're picking up in 1 John 2, verse 3. Chapter 2, verse 3. Now, we went over the context of this letter last week, but just in case you missed it or you need a refresher, this was probably written by John, the disciple, one of the 12 disciples that walked with Jesus for three years. The same author as the Gospel of John. It was probably written around 95 AD, so John was a very old man at this point, probably around 90 years old. And it was written to an early Christian church that had just been through some controversy. Um, there were people who had left the community, who had seceded from it, because they disagreed with John's teaching. And 1 John was written to encourage the people who had stayed, and to remind the community of what was false about what these secessionists were saying. So that's, that's the setup, and uh, let's dive in. 1 John 2, starting in verse 3. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brothers and sisters lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. All right, so remember, John is writing to a church that has just been through a church split. And he was writing to those who had stayed, those who had remained. Now, John doesn't tell us explicitly what the false teachers were saying that was false, but we can kind of infer it from what he writes. For example... Uh, John says, whoever says, I know him, 
So the whoever that John probably has in mind are the false teachers, the people who left. So one thing that we can infer about these false teachers is that, is that they were the kind of people who claimed to know God. We know God. And they were probably also the kind of people that emphasized that we know God better than you guys who are disagreeing with us. So the people who stayed were probably used to hearing, we know God better than you do. Now we should ask, okay, why did these secessionists claim to know God? Why did they think that they knew God so well? And again, we're not told, but I think we can, we can make a good guess what the two reasons might be, two possible reasons. First of all, maybe they were really educated. Maybe they were the kind of people who, like the Pharisees, searched the scriptures, had memorized a lot of it, could quote it back to you. Maybe they were the kind of people who read a lot of books and studied ancient languages, the kind of people who knew big theological words, like theological, and uh, maybe words like infralapsarian and supralapsarian. And, and maybe they considered those who did not know words like that to be unspiritual. And maybe they were the kind of people that judged everybody on whether they knew the right things and whether they held all the right positions on the things that they knew. So that's one possibility. Second possibility is that they were the kind of people who claimed to know God because of mystical spiritual experiences that they had had. Right? Maybe they were the kind of people who said, well, you don't really know God until you've had a vision like I've had. Or you don't really know God until you've spoken in the tongues of angels. Or you don't really know God until you've tried some of these mushrooms. Then you'll really know the divine. But John says that the evidence that we really know God is not how knowledgeable we are or how many mystical experiences we've had. Now, knowledge has value. Mystical experiences have value. But what really reveals a relationship with God is how we live. How we live. John says, whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. Now that raises the question, well, what does Christ command? Well, John gets a little bit more specific in verse 6, right? He says, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. So that gets us a little closer to what John has in mind, but it's still not entirely clear. If we're supposed to live as Jesus did, does that mean that we're all supposed to become itinerant preachers? Does it mean that we're supposed to call disciples to ourselves? Should we all be unmarried and childless? Should we wear a tunic and sandals, right? That's all part of the Jesus lifestyle that's living as he did, right? But clearly those things are not what John has in mind when he says, we must live as Jesus did. He's thinking of something more fundamental, something less superficial than those things that I just listed. And what he's thinking of is something that he calls an old command that is also a new command. Did you find that confusing when we read it? I know I was confused by it. An old command that is also a new, a new command. He says, uh, dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard, yet I am writing you a new command. It's like, what are you talking about, John? <laughs> I'm not writing you a new command, but I am writing you a new command. How do we make sense of that? The key to making sense of this is something that John wrote before this in his gospel. In the gospel of John, shortly before Jesus goes away to be crucified, he says this to his disciples, a new command I give you, love one another. 
as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. So, when this church community heard those words, new command, they would have thought of what Jesus says here. Love one another, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. But even though that was known as a new command, it was not new to the people in John's church. Because they had known that command ever since they began their Christian life. That command was a central part of the message that they had received from the beginning. Love one another as Christ has loved you. Love one another. So this new command has been going around in the church for the last 60 years. It's an old command. But it's also the new command that Jesus talked about in John 13. So, to summarize what John is saying here, hopefully this makes it clear. He's saying, what I'm talking about here, it's nothing new. You guys know this, this is old news, but the old news I'm reminding you of is what we know as the new command. Make sense? Okay, hopefully that clears things up. And so the real sign of whether we know God is not how many facts we've memorized, it's not what position we take on minor doctrinal issues that most of humanity will never know or care about, right? It's not how many mystical experiences we've had, it's whether we love one another. And this is what it means to live as Jesus lived. There are some people who think that if the church emphasizes love a lot, it's lost its way. It's gone soft. It's become Disneyified, sentimental. But love, rightly understood, cannot be overemphasized for the church. Can't be done. Without love, John says, we are walking in darkness and we have no fellowship with God. Love is supposed to be what reveals that we are followers of Christ. The Apostle Paul even went so far as to say that without love in our hearts, we have nothing. It doesn't matter if we know everything there is to know, if we can fathom all mysteries and possess all knowledge. It doesn't matter if we can speak in the tongues of men and angels. If we have not love, we don't have anything. That's not sentimental. That's biblical. And this love that Jesus calls us to is not easy. It's a calling to love not only the people we like or agree with, but even our enemies. Now, I should say, I've heard recently some people argue that when Jesus told his disciples to love one another, he was really only talking about how they treated each other. And so these people would say, well, for us today, if we're going to apply that passage accurately, it is a command for us to treat other Christians well. It's not really about how we treat others outside the church. Now, of course, these people would say, well, we should show people outside the, of the church respect and that sort of thing. But they would say that what Jesus is really talking about here is the command to love other people who are Christians. And apparently whole books have been written to try and argue this point, right? That the Christians' focus should be on helping their own. But I got some problems with that view. Jesus never told us that we should limit our love only to the people in our group. In fact, he did the opposite. After Jesus confirmed that the entire Old Testament law can be summarized with the command, love God and love your neighbor as yourself, someone asked him, well, who is my neighbor? Which is a polite way of asking, who do I have permission not to love? Right? Okay, I get it. I'm supposed to love my neighbor, but who does neighbor exclude? Right? Neighbor doesn't include everyone, does it? 
And Jesus responded to that question, who is my neighbor, by telling a story. A story about a Samaritan who helps a Jewish person. A good Samaritan. And as you guys know, if you've been around here very long, we've talked about this, Jews and Samaritans did not re regard each other as neighbors. They regarded each other as enemies. And yet Jesus tells a story about a Samaritan who helps a Jew, and then he says, be like that Samaritan. In other words, be the kind of person who shows love to people outside of your group, who crosses that boundary. And so Jesus' answer to the question, well, who do I have permission to not love, is no one, really. Of course, Jesus also explicitly said that we should love even our enemies. And he said, if you love those, sorry, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you, could do, if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. In other words, it is totally normal for people to look out for their own, their own group, their own tribe. That's normal. That's natural. But what's supernatural is when people show love to those outside of their team, outside of their tribe, their group or even those who are opposed to their tribe or their group. Right? The real test of Christian love is not whether we are capable of showing love to our own team, but whether we are capable of showing love to those outside our team, those from other countries, those of other faiths, those with different beliefs and values and politics. Even when we disagree strongly with them, are we able to be like the Good Samaritan and look out for them? Are we willing to help bandage their wounds? Do we go out of their way, our way to do that? Or are we more likely to think, well, that's not my problem. I just need to look out for my own. That's what Jesus cares about. Certainly, Jesus calls us to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Absolutely. But living as Jesus did requires us to go even beyond just looking out for our own. Let's look at the words of the new command again. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, of course, the idea that we should love one another was not entirely new when Jesus said it. Leviticus 19.18, way back in the Old Testament Mosaic Law, says this, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. There it is. But Jesus' command is new, because it's not just a repeat of those words from Leviticus. One, because of how expansive it is, right? That, that passage in Leviticus only talked about loving your neighbor, right? Your literal neighbor. But, but this talk, Jesus talked about loving the Samaritans and the enemy, enemies, the people that we regard as our, as our Samaritans and our enemies today, right? And then secondly... It's a new command because of the level of sacrifice he calls us to when it comes to love. Right? He says, as I have loved you, so love one another. As I have loved you. That is a very difficult command. How did Christ love us? Well, he loved us by humbling himself radically and then giving his life for our sake, even to the point of dying on a cross. And then Jesus says, be like me. This is the new command. This is how people will know that you follow me, if you have that kind of sacrificial giving love. That makes me uncomfortable. It should make us a little uncomfortable. I, I don't 
know that we've really understood it unless it makes us a little uncomfortable. The call to love is not for wimps. It's a call to die to our selfishness. It's a call to die to our desire for vengeance. It's a call to die to our desire for approval from other people. Especially the approval of our immediate tribe, right? Who might be uncomfortable with us showing love to those outside our group. It is not easy. But, John says, as we experience that kind of love through Christ, and as we reflect that kind of love in the world, the darkness passes and the true light shines. In other words, as we put that kind of love into practice, evil begins to flee. It's driven out, and it's replaced by light. This reminds me of a famous Martin Luther King quote. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. We humans have a very long history of falling for the lie that darkness can drive out darkness. And that hate can drive out hate. But the only thing that can drive out the darkness is living like Jesus lived. John says that if we hate our brothers and sisters, we remain in the darkness. And he says we stumble around, right? Not knowing where we're going. Like if you're in an unfamiliar place and you wake up in the middle of the night and you're trying to find the bathroom, it's no light. I hate doing that. It's kind of what it's like when you're filled with hate. It's like you're Stumbling around in the darkness, looking for something in an unfamiliar place. And of course, what, what Jesus is saying is when your heart is filled with hate, you lose your way. You trip and fall. You break stuff. One way of putting it might be hate leads to restless wandering. Like it did for Cain, the first murderer. If the church is going to see clearly and follow God faithfully, we have to rid ourselves of hate. And that is not an easy thing to do. You may have noticed that there are many forces at work in the world all the time that are profiting off of stirring up your outrage. Right? Because outrage sells. People know if there's an article that's going to stir your outrage, you're more likely to click it online, right? You're more, you're more likely to give your attention to that channel if it's making you angry, if it's telling you about things that you should be mad about. There's something about outrage that we tend to be drawn to. And yes, there are plenty of things in the world that are worth being upset about. That's true. And we do need to be informed to some degree, yes. But be careful how much you feed yourself outrage. Because if you feed yourself too much outrage, it will lead you to wander in the dark. So, it's a simple message today. If we claim to know God, we should love expansively and sacrificially. Simple idea, but a very hard one to do. But I will finish with some of the encouraging words that John wrote at the end of this passage. You might have noticed that the tone changed a little bit. He kind of had a little bit of an aside where he spoke directly to children, fathers, young men. And basically what he said was... You know the Father, you are strong, the Word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Now, John knew that the people he was writing to weren't perfect. He was fully aware of that. But still, he spoke those words as a blessing to them. 
like a prophecy that they could live into. And so I want to speak them to us in closing right now. Yes, the call to love is demanding. It is hard. But you know the Father. The Word of God lives in you. You are strong. You have overcome the evil one. And you can continue to overcome the evil one. If you walk in the light, walk in love. Lord, help us. Help us to do that. Help us to live as Jesus lived, as hard as that is, Lord. It is what you call us to. Lord, help us not to fall into the trap of being addicted to outrage. Help us to recognize that even though there is so much out there that is worth being angry about, that hate cannot drive out hate, that darkness cannot drive out darkness. So, Lord, help us to walk in the light. Help us to receive the love that you have for us and reflect that to the world. Empower us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
Now is the point in our service where we continue our worship through the giving of tithes and offerings and the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Here at St. Paul's, this table is open to anybody who has put their faith in Jesus. And if you're not sure what that means, if that includes you, um, I'd love to set up a time with you sometime to talk about that. Uh, talk to me after service or set up an email and, or send me an email and we can, uh, we can talk. Um, but you don't need to be a member here. You just have to be trusting in Jesus. And um, if today is the first day that you want to express, I am trusting in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, uh, for victory over the powers of sin and death, then you are welcome to come to this table. You'll never be turned away. Here at St. Paul's, the way that we celebrate communion is we invite you to, if you are able, to come up to the table. And uh, when you get here, I will say the body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. And you have two options. You can either take one of the individual communion cups and then go back to your seat and open it when you feel ready. Uh, or you can do it the old-fashioned way and you can receive right here at the table. You take one of the wafers, you dip it in the juice, and you receive it right here. And you can receive it saying, thanks be to God, or amen, or you can cross yourself, or if you don't feel comfortable doing any of that, that's fine, whatever you want to do. Um, but you have those two options. We also encourage you, when you come up to the table, to place in the basket underneath uh, your connection card with any prayer requests you have written on that card, any questions you might have. Uh, and we also do encourage you to consider putting an offering in the basket. Uh, every week we want to emphasize that you should not feel like you need an offering in order to come and to receive communion. That's not how communion works. But we do encourage you to recognize that giving is one way that you can express your worship to the Lord. And it's how our church is able to keep doing what we do. There's a lot of talk this morning about living as Jesus lived, and what a high and difficult calling that is. And we should not feel like we can come to this table if we are opposed to the idea of walking as Jesus walked, but we certainly should never feel like we can only come to this table if we are walking the way Jesus walked perfectly, because that is an impossible thing for us to do this side of heaven. We come to this table because we recognize that in order to love well and love as Jesus loved, we first need to receive the love that he has for us and the love that he poured out for us through his sacrifice on the cross so that everything that is necessary has been done to reconcile us to God and to defeat the powers of sin and death. So as you come forward, I, can, I encourage you to think that. This is, not, this is not all on you. The good news is that Jesus has done it for you. So come and receive. Let's stand and declare our faith to the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you declare the Lord's death until he comes again. 
So as you feel called and as you feel led, come and receive God's holy gifts for God's beloved people.
would you all rise with us as we close with a song? Thank you again so much for being here this morning. Don't forget, baptism and picnic on August 27th. Put it on your calendars. And if you're interested in baptism, please let me know. Let's say our benediction. While our service here has now ended, our worship has not ended because our worship never ends. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord and to love and serve his people. Thanks be to God. Amen. Water in the stone.